So Alan and got her PhD at the University of Amsterdam and then did postdoctoral work at Santa Barbara as a Chandler Fellow and then at MIT as a Hubble Fellow. She works on an impressively broad range of topics in high energy astrophysics and is especially well known for her work on looking at correlations between X-ray and radio emission in um, accreting X-ray binaries and most recently the demographics of supermassive black holes and galaxies. And this um, last topic we shall be talking about today is particularly interesting to me because we think that supermassive black holes regulate star formation, especially in high-mass galaxies. So understanding the progenitors of the most supermassive black holes that we see today is key to understanding a lot of processes that regulate star formation in galaxies and distinguish elliptical galaxies from disks um, and galaxies like ours. So she, today she'll tell us about trying to constrain the nature of the progenitors of these supermassive black holes by looking at nearby galaxies. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction and thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be back in Boston. And also I should tell you that I think I gave my very first talk in the US in this building. It was somewhere in the basement, I think. <laughs> I was so terrified. So this happened when I was still a grad student and I was sent on this US tour to you know, advertise your work when you're applying for jobs. I was, yeah, incredibly terrified, but, you know, I did get a job, so it didn't go too bad. I'm still here. So I'm here to tell you about the work that myself and my uh, group have undertaken over the last few years at U of M. Um, I've chosen to focus on this particular topic, that is the X-ray constraints on the occupation fraction of black holes in the center of galaxies in the local universe, because I personally think that this is the most valuable and interesting result uh, that came out of this campaign that I'm going to describe. Uh, however, I, I won't be talking exclusively about that. So in order to introduce you to this result, I will first briefly present the two um, surveys that we undertook with the Chandra X-ray telescope that target a sample of um, nearby <laughs> Uh, early type galaxies, a distance, a distance limited sample. So I'll tell you a little bit about the results uh, from that survey, the sort of census of the local um, weekly accreting a massive black hole population. So one thing that I want to make clear from the beginning is that uh, whenever I'll be talking about AGN for the rest of this talk, I am not talking about the standard AGN that you might be used to think about, which is to say accreting close to at a significant fraction of the Eddington limit. I'm rather talking about something that is more, um, can be thought of as in between AGN and completely inactive galaxy, formally inactive galaxy. So, Think about Eddington ratios lower than 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5, down to essentially a regime that is close to our own supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, which is obviously only detectable thanks to its nearby distance in terms of accretion-powered emission. 
So I'll describe the sort of face value results from uh, this program, which was meant to characterize the distribution and addington ratio of this inactive population of galactic nuclei over a broad range of stellar masses. And I'll um, talk about it in the context of comparing two different large-scale environments, so accretion within galaxies in a field versus within a cluster of galaxies. So the results from these two surveys led to the main topic of this talk, which is to combine the information on a possi possible uh, relationship between nuclear luminosities and whole stellar mass to infer the actual occupation fraction of black holes, not their active fraction simply, but the true fraction uh, of galaxies that host a black hole at their center, regardless of whether we can detect accretion power activity. Uh, I'll move on quickly to two other sort of secondary but still interesting, I believe, results from the survey, which have to do with the nucleation fraction of uh, this sample, and as well as the ultraluminous X-ray source population, also as a function of environment. And I'll end with a more recent uh, result, something that we're still working on, which um, relies on a, a rather different sample and survey and aims at looking for possible triggers of this low-level uh, accretion power activity in the form of a correlation between the presence of cold gas and supermassive black hole um, accretion. So I will start off with sort of the general motivation, the broader motivation for this study and particularly for wanting to constrain the occupation fraction of black holes in the local universe. So somewhat counterintuitively, uh, one might expect that doing so, that constraining the fraction of galaxies that have black holes at their center, particularly the small galaxies, stellar masses lower than 10 to the 10 solar masses or so, can actually help us discriminate between different predominant modes for seeding those black holes in the high redshift universe. So this cartoon is taken from a review written by Marta Volontari a few years ago, and it's meant to illustrate three different main paths that could have led to the formation of black hole seeds at Reshtiv 10 or 20. So definitely a regime that is not directly observable by any existing instrumentation. So broadly speaking, you can divide these families of model in the so-called light seeds, which would essentially result from the evolution and death of a massive star at high redshift, metal-free or metal-poor massive star, the so-called pop tree type uh, stars. Uh, so this would lead to seeds with masses of the order of 100 solar masses still in the stellar range. And then on the opposite end, uh, you might think about global collapse of, of gas towards the center of a galaxy, which then will lead to uh, formation of supermassive stars, which in turn would merge and form a massive black hole, which then for a limited period of time accretes at super Eddington rates and might end up forming something in the range of up to million solar masses. Now, I'm aware that particularly this last family of model from the numerical perspective might require a somewhat ad hoc um, assumption to work. But nevertheless, from the observational perspective, which I'm switching to with this slide, there is evidence for rather massive black holes of the order of upward of a, a billion solar mass being already in place at redshift 7. So this comes from the detection of a quasar at that redshift. So the existence of such a massive object that early on in the life of the universe, so when the universe was less than 0.8 giga years old, in order to make it grow to such a high mass, you require essentially unlimited continuous Eddington limited accretion starting from redshift 20 or so, just by a simple Salpeter time argument. Now you can evade that kind of requirement by positing that accretion can take place at super Eddington uh, rates for some 
time and many other uh, uh, considerations. However, the point remains that the existence of such high mass black holes and even potentially um, higher uh, redshift candidates starts to challenge the possibility that uh, light seeds be at the, um, uh, at the origin of this kind of monsters, essentially. And also, more broadly speaking, this could still be an oddball, some sort of tip of the iceberg in terms of the overall population, but what we might be interested in is what was the predominant mechanism for seeding black holes at high redshift. So here is where, again, somewhat uh, unexpectedly, the local universe helps us or might help us. Again, a nice illustration borrowed from a review by Jenny Green a few years ago. So illustrated here is the uh, idea that as time progresses and galaxies evolve, merge, and so do their nuclear black holes, you might, you might expect to end up with a different um, occupation fraction, fraction of galaxies that host a massive black hole by redshift zero, depending on the predominant seeding mechanism. With uh, direct collapse, i.e. heavy seeds, being the predominant mechanism, leading to occupation fractions between 30 up to 60 percent in galaxies of the dwarf size, so stellar masses lower than 10 to the 10 solar masses, whereas 100 percent occupation fraction is expected in the case of light seeds, death of a massive star type mechanism. So if we were somehow able to measure the occupation fraction in the low mass galaxies, we could you know, reverse engineer this and hopefully say something about the seeding mechanism. Regardless of whether you trust or don't, these um, models that are largely semi-analytical uh, uh, semi -analytical, uh, models, uh, this is still an interesting measurement uh, for constraining the local um, black hole mass function and the number density, considering that most galaxies are indeed dwarfs. So you can take a very simple approach to this problem. Take your favorite survey in x-rays or optical base, whatever you will, something that will measure activity from an accreting black hole and convert the measured acting fraction into a lower limit to the occupation fraction on the basis that in the absence of a signal, there could still be a black hole that is just fainter than our detection threshold. So this kind of exercise, you have an illustration of uh, how things might uh, work, again, from the same review from Jenny Green, uh, who was, was using actually results from our, our own AMUSE service plus, uh, I think, the Cosmos survey. So you might just do this one-to-one -one conversion very naively and plot fraction of galaxies with black holes as a function of the host galaxy mass and look at the you know, histogram compared with theory. Fine. Okay. But again, I remind you, these are actually lower limits that you're dealing with. However, what I'm going to claim here is that we can do much better than that. Observationally, we can leverage on a uniform sensitivity threshold, as well as a potential dependence of the nuclear X-ray luminosity on stellar mass that might be not linear, to correct and back up an occupation fraction. What do we need to do that? We need a, a sample that is unbiased with respect to nuclear properties. That's essential. Broad stellar range. And ideally, we need to be able to probe accretion-powered emission down to the lowest possible editor ratios. So I don't need to remind you that the um, you know, luminosity function, number density of quasars declines, uh, pass redshift between one and two, and that there is in this um, game a downsizing effect, shown here is the famous uh, Gunter Hasinger uh, and, uh, number density here, where the brightest of all quasars starts to decline at you know, earlier redshift at the more luminous population. So this kind of um, 
effect might lead us to expect that the very small galaxies and underluminous galaxies may be more powerful in terms of their edge ratios than their more massive cousins. And here is just a you know, simple example from an early seminal numerical work by Chotti and Ostreicher quite a few years ago, showing even in the absence of merger, because this uh, top panel shows the evolution of accretion power emission from a nuclear black hole hosted by a massive elliptical galaxy as a function of time, where after the black hole has undergone a repeated series of quasar phases approaching its lead Eddington limit, which is plotted as an almost constant, slightly growing line up there, by redshift around two or so, sort of settles in this quiescent regime, well below orders of magnitude below its Eddington ratio. This is uh, what we often refer to these days as the radio mode. So that type of feedback, which is thought to be responsible for, to work like a low level thermostat that keeps the gas sort of warm, prevents it from cooling and shuts off star formation in the big galaxies, at least. So I'm looking at those guys. I'm looking for those low luminosity, low Eddington ratio AGN in the local universe. And I'm doing though, so uh, with x-rays, okay? Again, here I'm taking an example from early work, early investigations of very low uh, Eddington ratio accretion power emission in the core of nearby galaxies. You see here for you know, those of you who are in uh, observations, a number of very well-known, well-studied galaxies, including down here is our own Sagittarius A star in the Milky Way. And shown here is as a function of their measured Eddington ratio, Eddington scaled nuclear X-ray luminosity, is the inferred accretion rate, Bondi accretion rate, scaled to the Eddington accretion rate again. So the point is that all these guys that we know and have studied extensively live in the region of the parameter space where highly radiatively inefficient accretion is taking place. So up here in this region would be your standard optically thick Shakura Sunyad disk. So this is where Quasar lives, but we have none of those in the local universe essentially. So this brings me to um, argue for the need of, since we want to push the sensitivity threshold down to the lowest possible luminosities, where we are not fully contaminated by emission from bright stellar mass black holes. So we need, it's essential that we uh, leverage the sub or second spatial resolution of Chandra. So what we did was to set out and carry out two surveys um, that were the result of two ch large Chandra programs, each targeting 100 early type galaxies. The first survey, Amuse Virgo, targeted uh, 100 uh, galaxies in the Virgo cluster, so homogeneous distance of about 15 megaparsecs, and the second targeted a similar sample, both unbiased with respect to nuclear properties. The sample had, were tailored to have a, a very similar stellar mass distribution. So what we want to do by look, wanted to do by looking at these things down to a limiting luminosities of about 5, 10 to the 38 ergs per second, which is close to the Eddington limit for a 10 solar mass black hole, was to provide a homogeneous and complete census of low level supermassive black hole activity in the local universe, also as a function of environment, field versus cluster. <laughs> and lastly, the main goal to use this information wisely to back up the black hole occupation fraction. <clears throat> So I'll just spend just a few words about the uh, methodology here, the challenges. So for those of you who are used to you know, X-ray, Chandra images, this is a relatively uh, typical image of a nearby elliptical galaxy where you need to remove all the soft diffuse X-ray emissions from the gas, you need to focus from hard X-ray emission from accretion power sources. And so we are looking uh, to, for nuclear hard X-ray sources. 
And the main challenge here is to cor correct for potential contamination from low mass X-ray binaries within the Chandra point spread function. And I say low mass X-ray binary because the sample was, in fact, because of that, was selected to um, only um, target early type galaxies where star formation is unimportant and high mass X-ray binaries which tend to be more luminous, would not be a concern. I will spend, uh, I, I will talk in more detail about exactly how we um, work on this uh, contamination towards the end of the talk. So if you trust me that we're doing a good job, and for the moment you have no choice, this is the, what, an example of essentially the differential X-ray luminosity function for the Virgo sample. So again, it's 100 objects all at a distance of 15 megaparsecs. Chandra looked at them down to a uniform luminosity threshold of 510 to 38. And this is the luminosity function of the nuclear detected sources after correction for contamination compared to, here in green, the expected luminosity function from low mass X-ray binaries. This is based on seminal work by Gelfanov and Grimm about 10 years ago where they uh, convincingly showed that the low mass X-ray luminosity function scales with stellar mass, where, whereas the high mass X-ray luminosity function scales with star formation rate. So the shape are obvious, shapes are obviously different, not consistent with each other, giving us confidence that we are indeed looking at a different population. Obviously, this regime is the one that's most um, um, <clears throat> difficult to assess, but we do that in a probabilistic fashion. So the first results, I'm just giving you, uh, throwing at you some numbers for a sense for the detection rates and so forth. This top uh, plot shows the distribution of our Virgo sample number of objects as a function of host stellar mass. The dotted histogram on top refers to the full sample and the dashed histogram is the X-ray binary contamination corrected detection popula detected population. Bottom shows the uh, active fraction rising as a function of stellar mass, which is a very well-known effect. It doesn't have to do with anything but, or at least is completely consistent with, Eddington incompleteness in the sense that when you operate at a constant luminosity threshold, you are biased towards detecting the more massive object uh, for at the uh, constant Eddington ratio because they're just more luminous for a given Eddington ratio. So active fraction for Virgo is close to 30%. And compared to the field, now these numbers are quoted after correcting for the different distribution of the stellar hosts, it's 50%. So they're um, not consistent with each other. On top of it, the Objects in the fields tend to be marginally brighter, again, after correcting for the different host distribution than objects in Virgo. So this is at face value. Um, then you can also explore the presence of a possible relationship between nuclear X-ray luminosity and host stellar mass. Now, why do we do that? Because if this were to be a linear, consistent with a linear scaling, this would argue for a uniform Eddington ratio, essentially, across the sample, which would mean that converting an active into an occupation fraction would not be biased either towards the low or the high mass end. Conversely, if a slope different from one is recovered, which it is, we find a dependence of X-ray luminosity uh, with stellar mass to the power 0.6. This means that the low mass guys, the low mass black holes hosted by the low mass galaxies, are um, have a positive, but there's a positive bias towards detecting those guys because they tend to shine at higher Eddington ratios, where I'm using loosely the term Eddington because I'm using stellar mass, not black hole mass but closer to that, then they're more massive cousins. So it's a sort of downsizing effect that we're seeing. So why do we care about this? There's not any fundamental relation in this, or at least not that I can think of, but we care in terms of working out 
of this measurement an occupation fraction. So this is back to the one-to-one -one conversion, essentially taking the limits, taking the measurements of the active fraction and converting them into lower limits. Which is, you know, it's informative. But again, a downsizing enhanced detectability of the low mass objects, low mass black holes in low mass galaxies, will bias high an estimate of the occupation fraction that presumes a uniform Eddington distribution. So there's, there's, there's information in the data that we can use to correct for that. Additionally, we have a sample that was specifically tailored to be um, uniformly targeted out to a uniform, a, a constant luminosity threshold, which we can use. So I'll spend, this is sort of the most important uh, slide and uh, plot of the talk, so I'll spend a few minutes describing it in some detail. Uh, <clears throat> so what we are doing here is a sort of two-step approach. We are starting from the data. So the data are shown here in the top panel as black points. The diamonds provided that you can see them uh, signify upper limits whereas the stars are detection, X-ray detection. 200 objects, you were throwing together the field and the Virgo objects. These horizontal do, um, dash line is our luminosity limit, the luminosity limit of the, limit of the survey. So that's the data. What we are doing next is to simulate a distribution of 50,000 galaxies that have the um, stellar mass distribution consistent with our data. Okay, and that would be, in terms of masses, um, this sort of big cloud of points, okay? Now we are populating this distribution with black holes according to the curves in the middle panel. These curves are parametrized by the analytic expression that you can see up there, it's only dependent by one parameter, which is essentially the value, uh, the, the mass, stellar mass at which the occupation fraction is lower than a certain threshold, I believe 50%. Okay? So each curve is a different model, it's arbitrary, but it's supposed to encompass a broad range of possibilities where you go from, say, this red curve here, you have a 100% occupation fraction at the very high mass end, and then a sudden drop, and no none of the low mass galaxies has a black hole to the more extreme here to the green side where you have nearly 100% occupation fraction for the entire distribution. And then obviously we have to introduce a cut, but that's outside of our stellar um, mass range. So then we are combining these two pieces of information by populating, for each model, we are populating a different fraction of our simulated distribution of galaxies, depending on the curve, so i.e. depending on the value of this m star zero, such that if you look at the green curve here, and you can sort of somewhat, if you squint your eyes, you can see green points in there, it means that all the green points and everything else above it will have a black hole, a nuclear black hole. Moving up to the red curve, only the red population up here will host a black hole in our sort of simulation box. Last thing is to combine this information about the actual occupation fraction with the ability to detect it given the threshold of our survey and taking into account the possibility that the nuclear X-ray luminosity may scale with stellar mass. So we are fitting simultaneously in a Bayesian approach for the LX to M star, nuclear X-ray luminosity to stellar mass, slope and intercept, an intrinsic scatter, obviously, and as well as M star zero, which is to say different models for the occupation fraction. So the final histogram, the bottom plus, shows you the result of this exercise in terms of how many of the black holes, the galaxies that we are observing, given all these constraints, would be observed to host a nuclear X-ray source. So then again, red goes with the red curve and the fit, best fitting line and so forth. 
So we repeat these thousands of times, again, a full Bayesian um, routine. And shown here is the posterior distribution of the occupation fraction for galaxies with masses lower than 10 to the 10 solar masses. So it's the range that we care about for constraining seeds as a function of this slope of the X-ray luminosity to stellar mass. So as you can see, we, are fairly, we do a fairly good job in constraining the slope that we knew already. And we do a so okay job, we are going in the right direction, in terms of the occupation fraction. It's a, this plot is slightly confusing, but just to tell you that we are, you know, these three um, values are for how aggressively we rem favored model would be the, the black, uh, the black star, the black cross with its uh, contour, gray contours, and you're seeing all the contours at different confidence levels. Move contamination from X-ray binaries, so our best. So, so, the message is, well, we are not certainly able to rule out any seeding mechanism at this stage. So the occupation fraction at that uh, mass range extends anywhere from 30 up to 100%. We can rule out anything lower than 20% with 99% confidence. Just to illustrate to you the power of this kind of analysis, Compared to the information that you, you would extract from the active fraction alone, which is plotted here as you know, um, black triangles, there is quite a difference in the uh, parameter space. So here we are seeing the uh, posterior distribution, essentially, of the occupation fraction as a function of who's the stellar mass. Uh, need to do better to improve on this measurement, and. Um, I'll skip the left uh, slide. This is just uh, after this uh, modeling. So on the one hand, not terribly constraining. On the other hand, the good news is we have done a study as to you know, what um, <clears throat> art artificially increasing the sensitivity of the survey, which anyway wouldn't be meaningful in that you start to hit all the X-ray binaries at that point. But here instead, it's more interesting to look at how much better we could do in um, constraining the occupation fraction and the slope, increasing the sample size. So this is our 200 object that we are starting with, and then 600, 1500, 3000 objects. Again, this would mean a sample is unbiased with respect to nuclear properties and uh, with a uniform sensitivity uh, threshold. So if you were to give me only a few more megaseconds of Chandra time, I'm looking at Belinda here, I can give you a measurement of this occupation fraction with a 50% error. And more interestingly, this methodology, I believe, is accurate and robust, so such that it can be actually applied to, in fact, any other electromagnetic wavelength, provided that you have a clean diagnostics of a clean and powerful deep, in terms of adding term fraction, diagnostics of accretion power emission. So this uh, sort of ends this part of the talk. I want to spend a, f uh, a few more minutes talking about other results that came out of this service and some more recent uh, work that we are undertaking. So one somewhat of a side issue which is also a complication that I have omitted conveniently from this talk, is that going towards the low mass guys, galaxies with host stellar masses below 10 to the 10, you're starting to encounter more and more commonly nuclear star clusters. So these are, they can be thought of as gigantic globular clusters, or though they're you know, different beasts size core radii of a couple up to five parsecs, uh, and they become progressively dominant down the mass function. In fact, uh, surveys conducted with the um, advanced camera for surveys on board HST have shown that as many as 80% of these spheroids below 10 to the 10 solar masses host a nuclear star cluster. That's uh, somewhat of a problem in terms of assessing contamination from um, X-ray binaries in that these guys tend to be somewhat younger perhaps than the underlying stellar population, increasing the chance that high mass X-ray binaries pollute the nuclear signal. In any case, we acquired, we have at, at hand dual band HST ACS data for the entire Virgo sample and a subsample of the field. 
um, and have done a study led by, by my grad student Vivian Baldassari to look for potential differences in the nucleation fraction, fraction of galaxies with one of these nuclear star clusters in the center across the two environments. We find that there is no measurable statistically significant difference between the nucleation fractions among the field and the cluster um, guys. And this, coupled with notion that came from Chandra, that the higher supermassive black hole activity for the field um, galaxies, both in terms of frequency as well as intensity, argues that somehow the funneling to the nuclear region, the gas funneling to the nuclear region, has been inhibited more effectively for Virgo galaxies since the last epoch of star formation, arguably due to run pressure or something like that. A second interesting result, this was led by my postdoc Rich Plotkin, um, is that given the uniform sensitivity threshold close to actually below the Eddington limit for a 10 solar mass black hole, we sort of got for free a clean look at the ultra-luminous X-ray source population in this sample. So UL axes are defined as off-nuclear point-like X-ray source exceeding the Eddington limit for a 10 solar mass object. Uh, some authors have different definitions, but so loosely speaking, uh, they are too bright for standard accretion onto a standard low mass X-ray binary, to brighten them to the point that people have um, suggest that they might host intermediate mass black holes uh, or be powered by uh, genuinely super into an accretion. Now, ignoring for the moment the fact that no star a few months ago have convincingly, has convincingly shown that one of these guys, one of the brightest, actually is a neutron star, an accretion powered neutron star, we looked at the entire distribution of these objects again across the entire sample. And after accounting for cosmic X-ray background contamination and everything else that you can possibly think of, conclude that the specific frequency of UL axis um, is independent of environment, perhaps uh, as expected. So Virgo and field uh, UL axis have the same um, frequency per unit stellar mass. Um, I, I much time I have. So in the last few minutes, I want to say a few words about this more recent study. This is work that is led by Eric Alfin, who is a, now a grad student with Brandon Miller, who led all the, all of the previous studies. So they're now working at Minnesota. So the idea behind this work was to look for a possible trigger for these emission, for these accretion powered emissions. So I think after you know, many dec decades of AGN studies, it is somewhat embarrassing that perhaps with the exception of the very brightest quasars, we still cannot, are not able to identify a unique triggering mechanism for this phenomenon. Okay. So one obvious place uh, one obvious parameter one could look for is cold gas, the presence of cold gas that can easily feed in a nuclear black hole. So with that in mind, we selected a sample of about 130 low inclination, now laid types for this work. Uh, again, distance limited. And we cross-correlated the Chandra um, catalog, the Chandra um, point source catalog for those with data from the alpha-alpha survey conducted at Arecibo. This is work in collaboration with Marta Heinz, um, unpublished Arecibo data yet. Uh, so what we're doing is looking for a possible correlation again between X-ray luminosity and nuclear H1 gas mass. So now this service, uh, service, this work is obviously suffering from a series of problems in the sense that the sample is much more um, heterogeneous compared to the amused service. So for instance, shown here is the overall distribution of it in terms of numbers as a function of distance. And shown in blue is the detection fraction, the nuclear detection fraction, which as you can tell, 
uh, drops rather dramatically past 50 megaparsecs. There's lots of things going on in here, obviously. Also, another piece of information in the bottom panel shown are the radial X-ray surface brightness distribution of three galaxies out of this uh, sort of three representative galaxies in this sample uh, as a function of this radial distance now from the center of the galaxy. And this uh, vertical line here in green, if you can see it, indicates the physical size corresponding to the Chandra, to an aperture of two arcseconds at the distance of five uh, megaparsecs, okay? So, uh, 50 megaparsecs, sorry, which is the same where we decided to cut here. So, meaning that past that distance is becoming difficult to disentangle nuclear emission from local processes from um, supermassive black holes. So, that said, we are uh, exercising a cut in distance out to 50 megaparsecs, and again, are looking for this possible presence of a you do a correlation analysis between detected or undetected, in fact. So the, the upper limits are shown as um, little arrows, whereas detections are crosses. Nuclear X-ray luminosity on the y-axis, top panels, as a function of overall stellar mass to the left, and mass in H1 from Arecibo, from alpha alpha. The two lines are showing a uh, results from the posterior distribution slope for the detection only and the upper limits included in the solid line, so that's what you need to focus on. Point is the following. There is a highly significant correlation between nuclear X-ray luminosity and stellar mass and a tentative correlation with a mass in coal gas at less than three sigma. However, when you do a joint fit of X-ray luminosity as a function of both, you find no significant, de significant dependence on the cold gas mass. So in other words, the apparent correlation is entirely driven by total mass, not by cold mass in there. Um, now for perhaps the more um, you know, technical X-ray oriented audience, I wish to spend just one minute discussing in some detail since I've uh, all the results here are fairly sensitive to the correction that we exercise against contamination to the nuclear X-ray signal from X-ray binaries. I want to spend a few words describing how we do that. So we are starting off from knowledge that dates back to 2003 and 4 that the overall X-ray luminosity function of X-ray binaries scales with mass for the stellar mass for the low mass objects and star formation, rate, star formation rate for the high mass X-ray binaries. This very convenient analytical expression is the result from a massive analysis work led by Brett Lammer and uh, expresses the total luminosity for a galaxy in X-ray binaries as a combination from low mass and high mass X-ray binaries. Now, what we are measuring is not the total luminosity, it's the luminosity within the nuclear uh, region within two arc seconds, so for the Chandra PSF. So we need to correct for that. What we do is that we use a template optical surface brightness um, for uh, the galaxy, for a galaxy, or we can do that for different types of galaxies. So we are estimating the percentage of the star formation and stellar mass that that galaxy has within two arc seconds. You can do it by galaxy by galaxy, or you can use a template that fits all of these spirals uh, decently. Um, so we're using two different star stage profiles, essentially. And from that, you infer a scaling factor for the X-ray luminosity from X-ray binaries from the nuclear region, also as a function of distance. So we have, in fact, in this paper that's been recently submitted, what I believe is the first um, polynomial parameterization of this quantity. And then after that, define the probability of hosting a nuclear X-ray binary, defined as this likelihood that the random variable from a Gaussian distribution centered in the measured log X and with a certain uh, 0.3 dex in, in, in sigma is less than the measured luminosity. 
So we assign a probability, and then we redo our entire correlation analysis a number of times, n times, n being a hundred or as many as you will, by randomly assigning to each data point seven, for example, if, if the, a detection that has 70 percent probability of being an X-ray binary and 30 of being nuclear, we are redoing the feeds a hundred times where 70 percent of the time we assign to it an X-ray binary identity and 30 percent of the time a supermassive black hole identity. Um, so these plots that are in math, different distance beams as a function of X-ray luminosity are showing the total expected number of um, detection in blue that, so in red would be the expected numbers of detection due to X-ray binaries. So essentially anything above the red curve is likely to be a supermassive black hole. And you know, at the end of the day, 51 out of 75 of these detections are likely supermassive black holes, black hole in origin. So this was just to address the issue of how we go about correcting from, uh, for X-ray binary uh, contamination. And I think this brings me to my conclusions. I hope I'm not too early. But I can talk more if you want. <laughs> so I have presented um, a series of results that came from two large Chandra programs that we dealt with the, uh, uh, over the last few years. Um, combined, um, they have provided observational constraints on the incidence and um, intensity of very low editor ratio supermassive black hole activity in the, early, in the local universe. And um, in addition to that, as a function of environment, and they also serve as a leverage for the first, I think, robust assessment, X-ray based assessment of the black hole occupation fraction in the local universe. The actual constraint that we have, which is to say ruling out an occupation fraction lower than 20% for galaxies in the dwarf or the low mass regime, is not yet constraining in terms of um, models, high redshift uh, seeding models, but I think the methodology is robust and has the potential to be either extended to a larger X-ray sample or to an entirely different band altogether. Uh, along with it, we have results on the nucleation fraction and ULX uh, specific uh, frequency. Neither of those depend on the environment, as in galaxies living in the field versus isolation. And then this more uh, recent result that is based on a different set of um, targets uh, is based on, um, me, based on Arecibo H1 measurements, we do not see any obvious correlation between accretion and the presence of cold gas within the Arecibo beam, I should say. So looking ahead, related to this last point, we have an approved ALMA program to do this in a more meaningful way, which is to say a much higher spatial resolution to look for um, um, the possibility of a relation between coal gas and accretion power activity. And then some other programs, um, largely again based on Chandra work, to target different environments, such as void, pure void galaxies, or uh, the Fornax cluster, which one could argue has a different um, character, in a sense, uh, than, uh, than Virgo in terms of its dynamical properties, and as well as lastly, extend the occupation fraction study to truly pushing it towards much lower masses, leveraging on a series of surveys uh, out there. This is work that we are carrying out in collaboration with Jenny Green. Uh, so I, I guess I'll stop here and take questions. I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment will be about the uh, nucleation fraction yes. in early type galaxies in Virgo and for in early type dwarfs. So um, 
Actually, uh, there were some optical measurements of stellar populations of those nuclei uh, from the late 2000s. Like there were, there was my paper, and there were papers by other groups. And they sh there's a whole zoo of nuclei. They are old, young, and whatever. However, there is another issue that the entire galaxy might be younger or older. So it might go all the way from 3 billion years to 11 billion years. And it's unclear to what you can uh, correspond, uh, to, to what you can correlate this age. But there's another issue with it is that in the nuclear star cluster, you might form X-ray binaries by capturing, like in global clusters. And this might boost your X-ray luminosity. So, but now my question is about the intermediate mass black holes. So you have, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that with different seeding models, you end up with 90, 60 to 90 percent fraction of uh, low mass galaxies hosting intermediate mass black holes. If we look in our close suburbs of the Milky Way, and you look at those at the, at galaxies in this in mass range, you get LMC, SMC, four uh, elliptical satellites of Andromeda, M32 and three uh, other ones, and M33. All M32 contains a black hole, and it's it's a weird galaxy because we suspect that it's been tidally stripped. So where are the 60 or 90 percent? So uh, first of all, the, the percentage that the theory uh, expects or predicts for the dwarfs is not 60 to 90, but it's 30 to 60. 30 to 60. So maybe more consistent towards uh, the numbers you're measuring. And secondly, well, I don't know if the LMC doesn't have a black hole because we frankly don't know where, where to look. And if you don't see anything, you don't know that there isn't anything. Yeah, there's no there. nucleus. <laughs> there is no nucleus, yes. That, uh, and also, regarding uh, your first point, yes, you're absolutely right. The presence of a nuclear star cluster, um, given the compactness of it, might um, enhance the expected number of X-ray binaries, not only by pushing it towards high mass X-ray binaries too. So, unfortunately, the X-ray luminosity function for nuclear star clusters is unknown, unmeasured. In fact, you turn it around. Now, the good news from our perspective, which is kind of sad news, but there is only two objects where we detect both a nuclear X-ray source and a nuclear star cluster. Um, what you can do is maybe, I don't know if it's the right way to do it, but that's what we try to do, is to put sort of an upper bound to that by using the X-ray luminosity function of globular clusters instead which you could argue have a much more dense environment and capture the formation of X-ray binaries by dynamical capture, maybe more you know, resembling, resembling the nuclear star cluster. So in fact, when I refer to being more or less aggressive in their cleaning, um, we have essentially discarded those two objects um. in the more aggressive. Um, Yeah, apart from the nuclear star cluster, so you know, early studies of M31 that, that we conducted show that there's a very large population of fairly bright X-ray binaries toward the center, and at distances that you're looking at, you're integrating over all of them. Um, and it does, and, and they're not a cluster. You might not realize that they're there. Time variability, you have know, a lack of it. You yeah, lack of it. Yeah, yeah. Anything might give you a clue, but if something turns on as a ULX, it's right in the range where you might be confused. That is a so possibility. Your results sound very reasonable, and the fact that your limit comes at around 10 to 40, I think is a very good sign. Yeah, I think that's about where yeah, you can you're to lose confusion from all of these other things. Yeah. But it, it's, a, it's an item of interest, and maybe one can turn it around that because you know you must be integrating over a very rich population, you may also be able to somehow tease out clues about that population, which at least we know locally in M31 is, is extremely interesting. Yeah. So but are you saying that the X-ray luminosity function of M31 does not match you know, what you would have talked about? about the luminosity function of the whole galaxy, but I'm saying at the center of the galaxy, so With the, what, yeah, yeah, the two or two or seconds at a large yeah, distance could encompass more than yeah, yeah, yeah. In that region, there is an excess of X-ray sources, and their properties are not necessarily the same as <coughs> other parts of the galaxy. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. 
yeah. So we are using one recipe for the overall X-ray luminosity function, not yeah, doing. I wonder, maybe that doesn't. No, no, that, that may be. In fact, center, yeah. Right? So the, this possibility that there is a, a, all these studies, I should say, that recover the X-ray luminosity function, the work, the early work by Gilfano and Graham and Humphrey and Ward and, and, and all those groups, uh, they typically chop. Out, you know, the nuclear regions are ignored for, because they might be contaminated by, by what I am after, and everything else is, you know, is game. So that that is a, a concern that can, however, be addressed. Uh, but yes, please, we, you need to build up the extra luminosity function for the central regions, and and then my black holes become your problem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I have a question on the uh, ULX population. Are those statistics derived only from early type galaxies, or is a mixed sample to no, those spirals? No, it's all the early types. Okay, yes. so that makes more sense. Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it does. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. mass. Exactly. <laughs> um, so given that, uh, can you exclude that these ul axis in the early, because we know for the late type galaxies, ul axis are connected with the star formation, right? Yeah. That's pretty solid. So uh, in the uh, early type galaxies, uh, you can exclude that these ul axis have just random floating black holes, intermediate mass in black holes. Can you put any constraints on that? Um, I haven't thought about it. I <laughs> No, <laughs> I'd be happy. <laughs> no, I mean, we are seeing most likely bright X-ray binary. Yeah, sorry. So in terms of numbers, if you look at the specific frequency, it is not, not, in, not inconsistent with our own Milky Way, right? Where there may be two ultra-luminous X-ray sources, you know, from the outsider's perspective, SS43 GRS 1915. Um, the, what is the chance that one of them is a wandering I don't know, this is probably more of a question for the theorists in the audience. So I'll the first one. But both of them are binaries, so they're not wandering. They're not wandering. That's true. Oh, yeah, no, in our galaxy, these are actually binaries. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So. <coughs> quick comment on Roseanne's point. I mean, the center of the Milky Way, of course, the bright bulge sources are just what you're talking about in M31. It's the very same distribution. So I was worried about that contamination also. It is a possibility. As I said, we are being more or less aggressive in this. And when I say less, uh, more aggressive, um, saying that we are using the X-ray luminosity function of globular clusters, which is a much higher normalization in terms of standard mass. And I think for the moment, that's, that's, you know, that's the best we can do until we have knowledge of the X-ray luminosity function of cluster cluster, which you could do. Um, additionally, uh, the majority of our detection are in excess of 10 to the 40. We, we could argue it's a safer regime. But the only way to do this is probabilistically, I mean, um, at least that I can think of. Well, I have another comment, which I think reinforces your results. Um, there have been two recent studies based on um, stacking analysis of uh, the cosmos sample. Yeah. Of uh, the elliptical sample that uh, Alessandro Paggi here has been doing, and the spiral sample that uh, Mar Metzpa has been doing, and Francesca Giovanni has also yes. been involved in these studies. And in both cases, for dwarf galaxies, we find excess X ray emission, which is yeah, consistent yeah, with. Yeah, I think, yeah Malte Schramm yeah. also yeah. did. Yeah. Was that the Cosmos sample? Malte Schramm, I think, had no, 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 no. okay. Yeah. No, I have a question actually. So if you have two galaxies merging, each of which has a supermassive black hole, the black holes might find their way to the center of the merger rim and eventually coalesce. And when they coalesce, they'll produce gravitational wave emission. And if that's an anisotropic, the rim and black hole will get a kick and possibly drive the black hole out of the galaxy. And this could be most important for low mass galaxies because they have shallow potential wells. So you could start off with a situation where each low mass galaxy at high redshift had a black hole. Yes. But yeah. because of this process by redshift zero, a lot of them would have lost their black holes. So how do you account for that in your analysis? 
observationally speaking, we do not account for this. You're yeah. seeing potentially an off nuclear X resource yeah, could well I didn't be. Mean in terms of the but observational is also, I mean, observation is, even if that were the case in a specific object, um, I doubt that even if this luminosity threshold is fairly low, if you was given the amount of gas that is around in, in these dwarf galaxies, even if you assume that bond day accretion from the surrounding, I'm not sure that would be a detectable X ray signal. Uh, but I guess all in, I meant was that this process the, could change the occupation. Oh, oh yeah, no. So uh, um, about that, actually, I think that all those semi analytical merger keys that Marta, Voluntary, and Priyana Trayan are doing, um, one of the reasons why the local occupation fraction for the dwarfs is so low in the case of heavy seeds is that not only they are not seeded in the first place, but there is this mechanism that during mergers, the gravitational potential of the dwarfs might be too shallow to retain a uh, newly formed black hole. So I think, I'm almost sure, that is accounted for in those models. But I guess your well, stress stimulation group, <laughs> you don't go and count them. I'm not sure worth that point, yeah. But that process could affect the case where they were formed by colony And then they're going away. Yeah. Josh, so if there's no correlation with the cold gas, what is feeding these? Things? I wish I had the answer. <laughs> have you it's done? Not that have, you, have you looked for radio permission from these? Not no. yet. But people have done that in real AGN, and no, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no obvious parameter that tells you oh, we're going to get the AGN. I mean, except for you, if you have a powerful merger and you have a quick You have an AGN, you have an AGN. If you don't have an AGN, you don't know why. I agree with that. <laughs> I mean, it's almost to the point of being stochastic. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's thank you.